Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon. Um, we are, I am, extremely delighted to welcome Dr. Christopher Fan back to Houston, which is his hometown. Um, sorry? It's okay. I may have already messed up something in the Zoom. Let's see. What did I do? I think, I think it's okay. Do I need to click something? Yeah, click okay. Click okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's try that again. Um, I thought that was for leaving meeting. Um, but yes, so what I was saying, Christopher Fan is here. This is his hometown, which means we also have um, the very special opportunity to welcome his family here to listen to him today. And I'm just very delighted for many reasons. One of them, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, Chris is my dissertation sibling which means that we shared the same doctoral advisor many moons ago. Um, and that means I have also known Chris and been reading his work for over a decade. And um, along with two other collaborators, we're working on a co-editing a special issue right now of the journal Verge called The Asian Century, Idea, Method, and Media. Um, I have relied on Chris for all kinds of professional and personal advice for many years as well. Um, what that means is that in addition to being a really brilliant reader of literature, culture, and history, which you are about to hear, um, I can tell you that he is an incredibly engaged interlocutor, a generous and inspiring collaborator, and a really wonderful friend. So basically, the best of the academy. And uh, all of the graduate students who are here, I highly encourage you to find yourselves um, a friend and collaborator like Chris. So I'm also delighted that we are able to celebrate today the upcoming release of Chris's book, Asian American Fiction After 1965, Transnational Fantasies of Economic Mobility, which is out next month from Columbia University Press. So Asian American Fiction After 1965 is an elegant, timely, deeply committed study of Asian American literature that rethinks many familiar questions and many of the things about the field that we take for granted. Who or what is an Asian American? Not in biographical, ethnic, or racial terms in any simple sense, but in historical and materialist terms. What are the consequences of the United States having moved from the exclusion of Asians from America to the calculated selection of desirable Asian immigrants to the United States in the late 20th century? How might we map the familiar immigrant narrative of intergenerational conflict onto the, quote, two cultures conflict between the arts and the sciences? What are the legacies of the Northeast Asian and American modernization projects, which emphasized technical and scientific skills in service of rapid industrialization? And what might a genre like science fiction have to do with all of this? In addition to this forthcoming book, Chris has published widely in a range of fields He's the co-editor of an edited volume called Techno-Orientalism, Volume 2, which is forthcoming. He's been writing on 20th and 21st century Anglophone and Asian American cultural production, Asian political economy, and speculative fiction. And you can read essays of his in numerous journals, including the Journal of Transnational American Studies, American Literary History, the Journal of Asian American Studies, Post 45, Anthropology and Humanism, and elsewhere. This year, um, Chris is a Mellon New Directions Fellow, which for those of you who don't know is a very, very difficult fellowship to get, um, in which he is focusing on human geography, political economy, and Taiwan studies in a project that is currently titled A Wave Called the World. In this new work, he aims to construct an empirical account of 20th and 21st century Asia, spanning Japanese, U.S., and Chinese colonialisms and neo-imperialisms, with the focus on migration in and out of Taiwan. And in this way, he is very importantly decentering the US and US academic discourse by approaching Asian America and Asian Americans from the perspective of Asia. So Chris's talk today is titled Northeast Asian American Literature in the Era of Deindustrialization. Please join me and the Transnational Asian Studies Department in welcoming Dr. Christopher Fan to Rice. Uh, good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining me on a uh, Thursday afternoon, um, especially those of you who face uh, uh, nasty commutes coming in and out of here. Um, thanks to everyone who is joining me on Zoom right now, and uh, thanks especially to Ryan. So this is a full circle moment for me in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fr front of the list is, is Ragini um, in, inviting me here. So Ragini, um, uh, find yourself a Ragini grad graduate students if you haven't already, have, haven't already found her, but she's been such an important interlocutor, uh, friend, uh, confidant as recently as, uh, as an hour and a half ago. Um, and uh, I can't imagine being in this profession without her. So thank you, Ragini, for Thank you for, for being you. Um, so this is, a, this is a full circle moment for me in a, a second sense. And Ragini already hinted at that. So my family is, is joining me um, here in the audience in real life uh, today. So I was, I was born in, uh, in, in Houston. I was born just a few miles away from here at Southwest Memorial Hospital. Is that right? Memorial <laughs> City. Memorial City Hospital, sorry. A little bit further away. But, but here, here in, in Houston, I grew up in Northwest Houston um, near uh, Willowbrook Mall. Um, and this is, this is relevant to the talk that I'm going to be giving today because, uh, my, you know, my parents uh, uh, came from Taiwan in, uh, in the early 70s. Um, they were both trained in STEM fields. My, my father, Tim, was trained as a mechanical engineer. My mom majored in biology in college. Both, uh, they met at the University of Dallas. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the shadow of NASA and in the oil and gas industries. And so science engineering, um, the, that was the, the air that I breathed, and that was the kind of culture and set of values that, that I grew up in. Um, and I think growing up in North, Northwest Houston, I felt a little out of place um, a lot of times. But writing this book, I, uh, what I learned is that uh, my story, my family story, my parents' story is actually quite typical. And in fact, it's quite typical to the group of people that we call Asian American writers, especially after 1965. So my talk is going to be unpacking and expanding upon um, this, this story that I just told you in miniature as my own story. Um, so before I begin, I just want to say an additional thanks to Alyssa Kafoy and to Hagen Matos um, for uh, facilitating uh, my, my, my visit here today. So uh, thank you for bringing me here. And um, just before I begin, one last preliminary, I just want to give a, a second shout out. Ragini already did it, but uh, Ragini, uh, I, and uh, Paul Nadal at Princeton, and Tina Chen at, um, at Penn State are co-editing this special issue of Verge called The Asian Century. Um, the deadline for essays is May 1st, so if you have any ideas um, for essays that you might want to submit for this special issue, then feel free to talk to, um, to email me, Ragini, Paul, Tina, Whomever, you can corner us after this talk if you're here in real life. Um, but yeah, shameless plug. OK, so on to the talk. Um, as Ragini said, this is a book talk. Um, this is, in fact, the, uh, the, the first book talk that I'm giving in the United States. So again, it's a very resonant uh, moment to be doing that here at, um, uh, in Houston, especially here at Rice. This is a campus that I kind of grew up on, came to a lot of events here as a child, a lot of a lot of dances, spent a lot of my teenage years here. Um, so uh, my book, again, is called Asian American Fiction After 1965. And what it does is it offers an account of contemporary Asian American fiction as an expression of the class formation of Asian American authors themselves. Uh, rather than account for all of Asian American fiction, it pursues a deliberately partial account of Northeast Asian American authors and their fiction. That is, fiction by authors who trace their backgrounds to Japan, Korea, China, and Taiwan. In other words, the preeminent sites of the Japanese colonial project that would fall under the aegis of US neo-imperialism after Japan's defeat and become the predominant countries of origin for the Asian America that has emerged since 1965, a predominance that is even more pronounced in the subset of post-65 Asian Americans that make professions out of writing and publishing fiction. So in a moment, I'll explain more fully my rationale for adopting this partial approach. But it would help to say here at the outset uh, that it follows from a conception of race and class as mutually determining social relations that culminate in what Colleen Lai has called racial form. So to put this another way, Asian American historiography and cultural studies have traditionally been pursued under the sign of race. So the questions of what makes an Asian American Asian 
and what makes Asian American literature Asian have been traditionally understood as questions about race. So the logic goes something like this. Asian American fiction is Asian because its authors are racially Asian. In other words, the racial character of the Asian American author is transferred to the work of Asian American fiction. So my premise is that what it means for an author to be from Asia is not just a question about race, it's also a question about class formation. So I want to emphasize the also here. Let me see if I can make this just, little. Yeah, I was just, I should have done it, I'm sorry. No worries. Okay. So I want to emphasize the also here because my goal is to think these two categories together. Not, I'm not interested in rehashing this sort of race first versus class first debate. But in the final section of my talk today, I'll turn to one of the most important recent accounts that we have of the race class dialectic in Asian American studies, which is Iko Day's 2016 book, Alien Capital. So what I hope becomes clear in the lead up to that final section is how class really complicates methodological and political orthodoxies pertaining to pan-ethnicity and strategic essentialism. For instance, the general sweep of an Asian racial identity can't adequately differentiate between, say, Southeast Asian refugees who arrive in the US with neither financial nor professional capital, and privileged Northeast Asian migrants who arrive with both. Differences like these really matter when thinking about Asian America, especially in regard to how racial forms vary across historical processes like industrialization and deindustrialization. So what I'm arguing is that these differences also really matter when thinking about Asian American literature. So my deliberately partial focus on Northeast Asian American authors and their fiction is not directed toward the exclusion of any other Asian American groups, but is rather an attempt at developing a materialist account of the Northeast Asian American author's production of fiction. Along these lines, I see my book thinking alongside books like Timothy August's book, The Refugee Aesthetic, from 2020, which connects the aesthetic forms in literature by Southeast Asian American refugee authors to the material conditions of their involuntary migration, just for instance. So here is an outline of my talk. I'll start by sketching out the post-65 historical context in my book's title. And then in the next section, I'll explain some of the origins of post-65 and the ideological formation of Asian American occupational concentration into STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. I'll then say more about the historical specificity of Northeast Asia and why it matters to studying contemporary Asian American literature. In the conclusion, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'll consider one of the major theoretical implications of all of this in regard to the study of racial form against the backdrop of shifting processes of capital accumulation. Okay, so part one, post 65. On or about October 3rd, 1965, the character of Asian America changed. That was the day that Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Hart Seller Immigration and Nationality Act. Seated at a desk on Ellis Island, darkened by the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, he declared that the act, quote, corrects a cruel and enduring wrong in the conduct of the American nation. So Johnson was referring to the longstanding system of exclusion based on country of origin and eugenic racial science that the 1965 finally brought to an end. While the act did not go into effect until 1968, there was an overnight explosion of immigration from Asia when it did. Since then, Asian America has radically increased in terms of national origins and in quantity by a factor of 25. And crucially, the act's skills-based labor provisions of, uh, shifted the basis of US immigration policy away from principles of exclusion to principles of economic selection. Madeline Shu explains that the shift, quote, turned immigration selection into an aspect of fiscal policy, unquote. And as a result of the shift, Jennifer Lee and Minzo argue, post-65 Asian America has become what they call a hyper-selected population. Not only did the act already privilege educated and highly skilled immigrants, but also, as Lee and Zhou writes, Asian immigrants are more highly educated than the average American, despite the tremendous heterogeneity in their countries of origin, unquote. The share of Asian immigrants who arrive in the United States with a bachelor's degree or higher has historically been the highest compared to other immigrant groups. Moreover, as Madeline Shu goes on to explain, 
The growing influence of such neoliberal principles has masked emerging forms of inequality in global migrations that privilege the mobility of educated elites, particularly for those concentrated in what are now labeled STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, and most prominently from Asia, unquote. The process that Xu describes here of occupational concentration into STEM fields is crucial for understanding post-65 Asian America and especially the unique character of the fiction that Northeast Asian American authors produce. Since 1970, trends have shown that Asian American men enter STEM fields at nearly four times the rate of white Americans. Asian American women enter STEM fields at lower rates than men, but still almost three times the rate of white women. And significantly, the trends of occupational concentration and academic achievement have increasingly been found in non-voluntary Asian immigrant populations like Southeast Asian refugee communities, which have historically experienced high rates of poverty and have struggled academically and professionally at a demographic level. Lee and Zhou additionally describe a phenomenon that they call second generation convergence, in which the 1.5 and second generation children of these immigrants begin to exhibit the academic and professional outcomes of more privileged Asian immigrants from East Asia and South Asia. Aside from the fiat of strategic essentialism, or more vulgar racial essentialism, the sole empirical factor vouching for the coherence of pan-Asian American experience is the fantasy of economic mobility behind hyper-selection, second generation convergence, and occupational concentration, processes that we might group together under the heading of model minoritization, and that pertain as much to class formation as racial formation. Even as the 1965 Act aimed to rectify America's Cold War persona of moral superiority, it was also designed to address looming economic stagnation, in particular a global restructuring of economic relations that saw U.S. companies responding to falling rates of profit by expanding the supply, their supply chains to countries offering cheaper labor. When American corporations turned to Asia in search for fixes to falling profits, what they found were the human capital products, both of U.S. Cold War neo-imperialism, as it interacted with Northeast Asia's drive to industrialize rapidly, and of the educational and economic legacies of Japanese colonialism. Meanwhile, when panic over the space race provoked American policymakers to forecast shortages of technical and scientific ex expertise in the U.S., Northeast Asian countries were producing droves of STEM graduates who needed jobs and advanced training. As a result, development economists began raising alarms about, uh, about brain drain. So in 1968, the drain from uh, Asian nations, particularly Taiwan and Korea, was most serious. Over 90% of Asian students who arrived from training in the United States never returned home. That's from a 1968 uh, early study of the brain drain phenomenon. Among the many reasons behind such migration, Annalise Saxinian observes, was that developing countries like Taiwan and South Korea, quote, typically lack the industrial base to employ the larger numbers of graduates who never left the country, unquote. In other words, there, these countries were producing tons of STEM graduates, but there weren't necessarily the jobs on the other side of graduation um, to meet them, so they often went to other countries, mostly the United States, for that advanced training and for those um, uh, professional opportunities. As Alejandro Portes and Adrian Celaya argue, quote, countries at mid-levels of development, like Taiwan and South Korea at the time, were particularly susceptible to this effect, the brain drain effect, since they were the most motivated to catch up with, advanced world and, uh, with the advanced world and, pos and possess the resources to copy its educational practices, unquote. Today, post-economic miracle, what once appeared as expropriation from the periphery to the core has now taken on a different guise as the Northeast Asian periphery has ascended to semi-peripheral status. While brain drain certainly continues, in 2021, Taiwan and Japan were the top two countries with the largest quote-unquote talent deficits, with South Korea in seventh place. The countries that in the post-war period were most impacted by brain drain now benefit the most from the return of their human capital. In recent years, China has entered the story of brain circulation. Saxinian, who's one of the sort of major researchers on brain circulation. Um, Saxinian writes, migration is now a two-way street, and the circulation of skill, capital, and know-how between the United States and China has reached unprecedented levels. The overseas Chinese and Taiwanese professional and technical community that built the bridge linking Silicon Valley and Taiwan in the 1980s and 1990s 
is now extending its networks to the technology regions in mainland China, unquote. So much of what my book explores are the stakes of Asian American authorship and fiction being drawn into the orbit of these human capital flows and into a posture in the world system that is as much sub-imperial as it is post-colonial. So what I've been sketching out so far is the historical framework for post-65 immigration and occupational concentration that forms the basis of the book. I've hinted at factors in Asia that have contributed to this, and I'll explain these in more detail in the next section, but I want to turn for a moment to the fiction itself. So post-65 Northeast Asian American fiction has been systematically shaped by these political economic developments, and in turn, that fiction has exerted a reciprocal force on post-65 Asian America itself by stabilizing racial and social forms that contribute to the reproduction of the human capital flows that I've just described. So I'll talk about two of the most uh, prevalent tropes that operate along these lines um, and that I talk about very extensively in the book. A couple of them uh, Ragini has already hinted at. So first, the two cultures conflict between the arts and sciences, to borrow a phrase from C.P. Snow. So when we find art taken up as a theme in post-65 Asian American literature, its production, its consumption, its aura, the two cultures conflict signals how art is formulated dialectically with an ideology, ideology of science and its role in industrial expansion. Art is often evoked in conflict with the sciences, which stand in for much more than scientific, a scientific worldview and STEM professional identity. The two cultures are always at the same time a figure for intergenerational conflicts, the ambivalences of racial identity and national belonging. And when we encounter characters trapped between two seemingly irreconcilable cultures in Asian American fiction, a trope as trite as it is true to life, we often find the arts and sciences in tension with each other. So the example of this I like to point to is Wei Ki Wang's uh, debut novel, Chemistry, from 2017, which is about a chemistry PhD student who moonlights as a creative writer. Um, but thinking more structurally about this two cultures conflict, John, the genre of science fiction itself is a kind of sublation or a synthesis of the two cultures conflict, which is one reason why Asian American authors have been attracted to it. The second trope that um, just, this is just uh, the second of many tropes that I track throughout the book, um, but the second most prominent trope is the return narrative, which Raghini Srinivasan has written about extensively in the context of global India and that I cite extensively from in the book. So for those of you familiar with the Taiwanese-American writer Hua Xu's memoir, Stay True, which won the Pulitzer Prize last year, uh, you will recall the post-65 character of the return narratives he describes. I don't, th this, is, this is kind of a B-side to the book. It's not in the book. Um, this, is, this is some new stuff. Um, so when Hua is in high school, uh, Xu's father, his father, uh, a post-65 Taiwanese immigrant turned STEM professional, returns to Taiwan, specifically to the city of Xinzhou, which is like Taiwan's Silicon Valley. And this is how uh, Hua Xu writes about his father. My father was finally able to go back as part of a wave of Taiwanese who were bringing their business and engineering expertise back home to the island's nascent semiconductor industry. He was hailed as a kind of returning hero, unquote. So Xu says here he was final, his father was finally able to go back because like many Taiwanese in the US who engaged in political activities under, uh, during the martial law period of Taiwan's history, Xu's father was blacklisted by the ruling Guangdong uh, party from returning home for many, many years. So it's only after he circulates back to Taiwan following the lifting of martial law in 1987 that he begins to correspond with his son back home in Cupertino via the fax machine. This is sort of, you know, one of the, I guess, most famous aspects of Stay True, these fax conversations that Hua Xu would have with his father uh, across the Pacific. So for those of us who are older, old enough to remember this technology, um, the fax machine is a communication technology that combines immediacy with free-form graphical expression. So it's just like a photocopier that sends that photocopy to be printed out, you know, on the other end of the conversation. So the fax machine makes it possible for a young Shu and his father to exchange immediate reflections on current events like baseball games and Kurt Cobain's suicide, as well as less temporally bounded reflections on life which in his father's faxes are often punctuated with a really beautiful question. What do you think? That's a question whose intimacy and invitation to expansiveness in some ways reflects the affordances of the fax medium itself. So while return narratives have been a mainstay of memoir and autobiography, um, like Stay True, 
uh, by Asian Americans for more than a century now, it's really only relatively recently, in the last 25 or 30 years, since the 1990s, that return narratives have become available to fictionalization. So it's only recently that we start to see narratives of return appear in fiction itself, rather than being the exclusive reserve of memoir and autobiography. So an early example of these fictionalized return narratives would be a very brief detail at the end of Chang Rui Li's uh, debut 1995 novel, Native Speaker, in which the, um, the villain, John Huang, after everything's fallen apart in his life, he returns to South Korea with his family. And it's set in passing by a real estate agent. Uh, so 1995 is a bit too early for these narratives of return to Asia to be sort of more fully connected or fleshed out. So it's not until Li's most recent uh, novel, A Year Abroad, which came out in, tw in 2021, that he actually unfolds a very full narrative of return. So almost every recent novel by a Chinese-American or Taiwanese-American writer, at least the ones I've read, I've read a lot of them, um, includes some narrative of return. It's not as prominent a trope in fiction by Korean-American or Japanese-American authors, uh, though some exceptions would be novels by Sergei Chung, for instance, Long for This World, or Ruth Ozeki's uh, 2013 novel, A Tale for the Time Being. So I don't have to prime time to parse these kind of uh, nationally specific uh, contexts here, but suffice it to say for now that much of my goal with this book is actually to bring to our attention these kind of material differences and material histories, precisely in order, in order to theorize them together as related aspects of the political economic formation called Northeast Asian America. Okay, section two. Modernization theory and the invention of Asian STEM nerd. So in this section, I press deeper into the origins of 1965 and occupational concentration to examine the Asian-ness of post-65 Asian American authors and their fiction. The main goal here is to avoid the methodological nationalism that often limits area studies accounts, as well as Asian Americanist work that narrowly targets US imperialism and Cold War formations and instead attend to processes unfolding regionally and across colonial regimes. Modernization theory is one of the key bridges between these trans-imperial processes and the development of post-65 Asian American human capital. Modernization theory played an outsized role in directing the economic miracles in Northeast Asia. My focus on these countries, as I explained earlier, is far from arbitrary. Not only are they points of origin for the majority of contemporary Asian American writers, but they also form a political economic totality whose coherence was underwritten by imperial projects of scientific knowledge production. These countries were thought of by modernization theory theorists as testing grounds for their social engineering and policy experiments. Far from being isolated cases, their economic development was determined by the dual hegemony of the United States and Japan, as well as their interrelations with each other. With the exception of Manchuria, this formation would be recreated after Japan's defeat, but under the auspices of the, US, of the United States, as Bruce Cummings recounts in a well-known anecdote. Quote, in, septem in September 1945, a US occupation, uh, as US occupation forces filtered into, into Japan, an American officer walked into a Mitsui office in Tokyo and introduced himself. A man in the office pointed to a map of the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, which was the name for Japan's colonial project, and said, there it is, we tried, see what you can do with it. <clears throat> Asian American authors have increasingly turned their attention to Japan-US imperial continuity. A very recent example of it is Ed Park's new novel, Same Bed, Different Dreams, which is a fascinating, expansive novel that traverses 20th century Korean history from Jap uh, Japanese occupation to the partition of the peninsula, the war in US neo-imperialism, post-war dictatorships. And in the novel, he searches out the patterns and rhymes between very, very disparate contexts. So uh, he tries to link events like the assassination of Itoki Rogumi and President William McKinley. So a big portion of the novel approaches all of this from the perspective kind of unexpectedly, but if, you know, hopefully by the end of this, this talk today, you'll, this will be a little bit less unexpected. But he approaches all of this and uh, situating all of these patterns and describing um, uh, and linking all of these disparate historical events. He approaches it from the perspective of science fiction writers and metafictional Korean American authors themselves. Um, uh, the, the, the one of which I have in mind is supposed to be a figure for 
and Park himself. So it's hard to describe the novel in a nutshell, um, and it only came out just last year, so I couldn't engage with it in my book, but I recommend it very highly for anybody who's interested in these topics. Um, among the authors I do discuss in my book, uh, whose work thematizes transimperialism, are uh, Ken Liu and Ruth Ozeki. So transimperialism and the link between modernization and colonialism are running themes in several of Ken Liu's stories, but the text that I spend the most time on is a novella called The Man Who Ended History, a documentary, which is a work of science fiction that focuses on, late 20th uh, on a late 20th century effort by a Chinese-American history professor and his Japanese-American theoretical physicist spouse to win posthumous justice for the victims of Japan's Unit 731, which conducted human experiments on Chinese and Allied prisoners in Manchuria during World War II. And for UK drama fans, Unit 731 is the inspiration for the recent Netflix series, Gong Song Creature. Uh, Ruth Ozeki's work, meanwhile, has often touched on transimperialism, but she directly engages it in her novel, A Tale for the Time Being. So what you see in a lot of this transimperial fiction, I'll call it, are formal effects that have to do with the inadequacy of the nation state as a narrative horizon, because historical justice sort of necess necessarily transcends the nation form. Loose fiction is interesting because it links that transcendence to identity formation. So the man who ended his history critiques the, nation, the national forms embedded in Japanese American identity and reaches instead for an, ident an identity rooted in a kind of anti-national Japanese-ness situated in a trans-historical, almost geological time scale. There are moments in uh, Ozeki's novel that make the same kind of um, uh, expansive time scale, move to an expansive time scale. Um, and tries to recover some sense of Japanese-ness Japanese that's uh, detached from uh, the national forms of Japan. So I'm happy to elaborate on all this in Q&A, but the point here is that one of the reasons why Asian American authors are turning to moments of trans-imperial history is because they're bumping against the limits of national forms of identity such as Asian American identity. So as they bump against the limits of what Asian American identity means to them and to their subject matter, they start to turn to these histories that precede them, and the trans-imperial moment between um, U.S. Uh, sorry, Japanese colonialism and uh, and uh, U.S. Uh, colonialism and neo-imperialism is a really, really sort of uh, um, a rich vein for them to mine. Modernization theory would enter post-war Asia through two main avenues, both paved by militarization, foreign aid, and the marketplace of ideas. The 1950s was a crucial period for shaping economic policy, especially in regard to land reform, which the United States underwrote in South Korea and Taiwan. The modernization theorists saw both as countries barreling toward economic takeoff. That was the term that modernization theorists used at the time. And they salivated, it is still used today, and they salivated over the potential to skip stages. This is another term that's still, that's a, that's a holdover from modernization theory. From 1953 to 1958, the United States sent $270 million per year to South Korea for reconstruction. And during that same period, Taiwan received almost half of its public infrastructure funding from the United States. As Japan, meanwhile, was weaning itself off of its dependency on the United States, it began to develop dependency in Taiwan and Korea, thus recreating the pre-World War II tripartite colonial structure. In 1930, the Japanese economist Akamatsu Kaname famously dubbed this the wild geese flying formation of development with Japan as the lead, um, as the lead advanced economy, as it was called. And the less advanced economies of Manchuria, Korea, and Taiwan served as markets, uh, as markets for Japanese um, manufactured goods and low value added and as sources for low value added manufacturing. In, 19, in the 1980s, this flying geese formation entailed Japan outsourcing its low value added production to Taiwan and South Korea. So Bruce Cummings offers the example of, quote, letting Taiwan and South Korea assemble color television sets while jealously guarding the technology necessary to make a color picture too, unquote. And with the Kuomintang's uh, relaxing of travel and economic policy with China in the 1980s, the role that Taiwanese entrepreneurs that are often called the Taisang played in jumpstarting China's world historically rapid economic development would resolutely shift Taiwan into the status of semi-peripheral nation. In Shelley Brigger's phrase, the tiger would begin, the tiger, the, you know, uh, the, the tiger economy of Taiwan would begin leading the dragon of the Chinese economy. So to help clarify how all of this matters to post-65 Northeast Asian America, we can linger for a bit longer on the example of Taiwan. 
So in contrast to South Korea and Japan, modernization theory and indeed economic development itself were in some ways a much tougher sell than post-war Taiwan. As J. Megan Green writes, quote, although the KMT government was committed to promoting industrial science policy on the mainland, it lost interest in this area of development in the 1950s and 1960s in Taiwan, unquote. During this period, Chiang Kai-shek and his inner circle were much more concerned with political stability and building the military capacity to retake, to retake mainland China. However, a rear guard effort led by Western trained technocrats and US agencies advocated for modernization style economic development. In the late 1960s, the KMT responded by launching a quote, low level propaganda campaign that would boost interest in science and technology. Unquote. Indeed, before this point, humanities and social sciences saw the highest enrollments among undergraduates and graduate students. So for different reasons, this was also the case in South Korea. The social sciences would take the top spot until the, until the mid-1970s, at which point engineering began to catch up. And as Green observes, it wasn't until around 1980 onward that engineering, scientific, and technical fields would definitively become the most popular fields with the humanities and social sciences steadily falling in popularity. And so in the, 1970, in the 1960s and 1970s in Taiwan, there was a popular saying, um, Lai 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 Tai Da, Chu 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 Mei Guo, which translates to first come to National Taiwan University, which was the premier university that trained a lot of these um, STEM, uh, STEM graduates. Um, so first come to National Taiwan University, Tai Da, and then go to the United States, go to Mei Guo, uh, for your advanced training, for your professions in STEM fields. And so uh, part of uh, what I'm uh, trying to sort of shine light on with this, um, uh, 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 with the story that I'm telling is how this production of the stereotype of the Asian American math and science nerd was actually the, the sort of successful outcome of authoritarian impositions on human capital development in countries like um, Taiwan and South Korea. Okay. All right, part three, the Northeast Asian American author. Occupational concentration in STEM fields has impacted nearly every segment of Asian America. It has impacted Asian Americans who become authors in a particular way. So I should say here very quickly that when I use the term Asian American, at, you know, as I've been using it throughout this presentation, I, I'm often using it as a shorthand for Northeast Asian American. So it's a coalescence of occupational concentration into an aggregate type of the post-65 Asian American author that Cheng Rui Li describes in the 2017 interview where he said, quote, a lot of Asian American writers, mostly of my generation and a little younger, and without exception, I mean really without exception, you know, at a writer's conference, maybe 20 of us sitting around, every single one of them started out in a very professional, very respectable gig before they threw it all away to become a writer. So part of what Lee is describing here is not particular to Asian American authors and is in fact a long-standing feature of creative writing in the United States. So as Mark McGurl has shown, university housed creative writing programs have dominated the production of American fiction in the post-war period, all but completely wiping out the distinction between professional and author. But the detail that Lee adds that his Asian American colleagues, quote, started out as professionals before throwing it all away, hints at the particularity of a post-65 Asian American author who has been subjected to a kind of double professionalization. Generally hailing from a professional managerial class or PMC background, most of these authors pursued a PMC career tra trajectory before turning to creative writing. And so Amy Chua, for example, would be a, a sort of a paradigmatic example of this. Um, she just published her first novel. It's a, it's, a, it's a murder mystery called The Golden Gate. I read half of it on the flight over here, and uh, I have to say, it's, uh, it's not bad. Um, <laughs> but would we expect anything less from Amy Chua? Um, so I think what the, the Amy Chua example, uh, I mean, it's not just for laughs. It's, it, it's also a, a sort of illustration of how the writing of fiction or the production of culture is in some ways uh, coded differently than it was perhaps, in a, in perhaps 30 or 40 years ago. Now, instead of sort of being a kind of oppositional move, produ producing culture, writing literature, now it's, it, it's in some ways the crowning achievement of a certain kind of class development or a certain kind of class identity. Okay, so in my analysis, it's, it's like a power move, right? So we can imagine Amy Chu is saying, I can write fiction too. Um, 
In my analysis, the figure of the Asian American author never refers only to individual authors. Even when I focus on individual authors, my goal is to account for their typicality. And so, you know, at the beginning of this talk, I talked about how, you know, I sometimes felt out of place in Northwest Houston, sort of far away from the Asian American mothership, which is mostly here in Southwest Houston. Um, and uh, at least that's the way it was when I was growing up in the 80s. Um, but realizing while I was writing this book how actually, how quite, how typical um, I was and how typical my family was and how kind of, um, uh, how that made me feel connected to, <laughs> to the movements of history rather than alienated from it. Um, perhaps a little bit more of both, you know, alienation and connection. Anyway, uh, as Yun Sun Lee elegantly explains, the category of the typical is different from the stereotypical. Uh, the quote, type embodies the contradictions of a historical moment rather than a reified social or demographic category, unquote. I approach the Asian American author as a class formation that's certainly racialized, but that can be understood in more depth if we approach it as an instance of a transnational professional managerial class, or PMC. Defined by jo Bar John and Barbara Ehrenreich in an influential 1977 article, the PMC consists of, quote, salaried mental workers who do not own the means of production, so they're not the bosses, they're not capital, and whose major function in the social division of labor may be described broadly as the reproduction of capitalist culture and capitalist class relations. So they don't own the capital, but they are responsible for reproducing and managing its re reproduction. For post-65 Asian American authors, double professionalization brings an additional resonance of racialization into the tension between institutionalization and aesthetic freedom. And the PMC's awkward class, class position resonates with the awkward racialization of Asian Americans. And additionally, with the even more awkward racialization of post-65 Northeast Asian Americans as institutional creatures of the university above all. Resisting this association with the university is, in fact, among the impetuses behind a recent spate of novels featuring college and grad school dropouts, such as, this is just tip of the iceberg, Elisa Chang's Queer's Paradise, Elaine Chia Cho's Disorientation, Jing Chen, Ho's Fiona and Jane, Grace D. Lee's Portrait of a Thief, Lisa Ko's The Leavers, Celeste Ning's Everything I Never Told You, Kathy Wang's Family Trust, and Wakey Wong's Chemistry that I mentioned before. A more ambivalent approach to the university as a site of capitalist excess and moral proving ground might be tracked to Silicon Valley novels, which exchange the college campus for the tech campus. And so this theme is especially pronounced in Charles Yu's fiction, uh, particularly his novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe, Anna Yen's Sophia of Silicon Valley, and Kathy Wing's Imposter Syndrome. Underlying the tight association with the campus, and more generally institutions, is a unique dynamic that arises from the awkwardness of the PMC's class alignments. As Yun Mi Cheng puts it, quote, the linear relationship, I don't have that quote up here. Sorry, I don't have the quote up here. Um, but the linear, this is, this is the Yumi Chang quote, quote, the linear relationship between race and class inequity, that being racially different has negative class effects, is derailed for Asian Americans. For Asian Americans, the conventional relationship between race and class inequality is inverted, unquote. This inversion certainly has not always been the case in Asian American history. It would not be going too far to argue that what distinguishes post-65 Asiatic racial form from its pre-65 regime is precisely this inversion. Indeed, a desire to explore periods of Asian American history in which this inversion, in which this inversion was not dominant, in other words, in which race and class inequality were not inverted but correlated directly, um, offers one explanation for the recent mini-boom of Asian American historical fiction set during the exclusion, the Chinese exclusion era which include what Julia H. Lee calls neo-frontier narratives. For instance, Si Pam Zhang's How Much of These Seals Are Gold, Jenny Tinghui Zhang's Four Treasures of the Sky, No Relation, Tanya Yani Gahara's To Paradise, Tom Lin's The Thousand Crimes of Ming Tzu, Brian Lung's Take Me Home, and Peter O'Davey's The Fortunes. And there's, I've heard it more since, but this is, this is you know, taken from uh, the text of my, uh, uh, text of my book that, um, from a year and a half ago, but more of the stuff is being produced every day. So in other words, the past operates not so much as a temporal category in these works, but as an ideological framing of Asian American life that has not been inverted. And as, des and as disparate as the ethnic and national backgrounds of these authors might be, what they hold in common are MFAs, if not also, as Chang really put it, a, quote, very professional, very respectable gig, unquote. 
So tracking the trans-imperial itinerary of modernization from Northeast Asia helps us to see that the hyper-selective professionals who came after 1965 and whose children now produce the bulk of Asian American literature themselves came of age in a milieu in which their scientific and technical career visions were anything but value neutral and their professional identities anything but non-ideological. These were people who felt their proximity to the Pacific ruling class if they were not already members of it. And they were told to return to their home countries one day to participate in reconstruction and nation building like Huashi's father. Some ignored or were unable to answer this call because they were escaping actual or potential personal, uh, political persecution. Many more simply ended up staying in the United States much longer than they had intended. Educationally and sometimes financially privileged as these immigrants were, often their lives did not pan out in the ways that they might have expected. As the immigrant parents in so much of post-65 Northeast Asian American fiction know painfully well, heroic training in STEM professions doesn't come close to translating to heroic status in the United States. What often awaits them instead is deprofessionalization, proletarianization, and middle management. These defeats and disappointments have been reason enough for these immigrants and their children to circulate back to their home countries, or at least to imagine doing so. And they've been reason enough for the authors who emerge among post-65 Asian Americans to risk exchanging the compensations of Asian American identity for the science fictionality of a global Asian economic futurity. So to my mind, the work of fiction that most sharply portrays this sometimes maddening tension between enough and not enough is Charles Yu's debut novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. In one of the opening scenes, the protagonist, who's also named Charles Yu, uh, and his father, they together open a new pack of graph paper. They peel, peel off the cellophane, they take this big stack out, peel off the cellophane, and then take a, a fresh pack, uh, a fresh pad, and put it in front of themselves. And there, Charles Fathers begins to teach him the principles of physics. And he says, choose a world, any world. It was a stack of planes, an n-dimensional space-time, ready to be filled, unquote. So this, this kind of blue sky, science-driven optimism depicted in this, um, this passage is, in one sense, the inheritance of the arch-modernization theorist Walt Rostow's belief that the falling rate of profit could not possibly hold true as long as scientific discovery was possible. In another sense, it measures the immense disappointment that Charles' father feels when his career stalls out, which he suspects is due to racism, the so-called bamboo ceiling, the sort of Asian version of the glass ceiling. Yu's novel, and its fiction more broadly, explores the hopes and disappointments of immigrants who enjoyed some success after arriving in the United States, but not enough, and for whom the science fictional universe is not an abstraction, but a project to which they and their STEM skill sets have directly contributed. The science fictional universe that in Yu's novel is an enterprise that expands infinitely into time and space in search of profit fixes is an allegory for the global capitalism that post-65 Asian American STEM professionals have played a special role in constructing. So in the novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, the protagonist's father, a Taiwanese-American immigrant, who develops the physics behind the industries that create the novel's science fictional universe, often uh, offering the thinnest of allegories for the major role that East Asian immigrant entrepreneurs played in developing the technical expertise and supply chains that made possible Silicon Valley's ascendancy uh, beginning in the 1970s. Annalise Sixinian calls this group of immigrant entrepreneurs the, quote, new Argonauts. Uh, Charles' father's ambition, which can't be contained even by multiple universes, exaggerates the class aspirations of his generation of Taiwanese STEM professionals. In many of the works of post-65 Northeast Asian American literature, the gender dimension of these disappointments of economic subject formation is revealed through narratives of downward economic mobility and deprofessionalization. An example of this can be found in Maxine Hong Kingston's 1976 work of autofiction, The Woman Warrior, a memoir of the girlhood among ghosts. And how I fit, Maxine Hong Kingston was born in Stockton uh, in the 30s, and so, you know, um, to, it, I, can, I can talk about during Q&A how she fits into this kind of post-65 framework. But suffice it to say that Woman Warrior sort of observes a transitional moment in the post-65 period between the sort of pre-65 non-occupationally concentrated uh, uh, formation of Asian America and the post-65 STEM occupational concentrated formation of Asian America. So there's a strange scene in the chapter of Woman Warrior titled At the Western Palace. 
Maxine's mother, Brave Orchid, is trying to reunite her sister, Moon Orchid, with her husband, from whom she's been separated for some 30 years, and who is a doctor with a practice in Los Angeles. So one of the strange things about this chapter is that Moon Orchid has no desire to reunite with her husband, because she's been living very comfortably in Hong Kong, uh, funded by her husband's very generous remittances. A brave orchid bullies her into going through with this reunification, driving her 300 miles from Stockton to her husband's medical office in downtown, downtown LA. And they pull up at the curb, and uh, I think brave orchid like literally says, leave the motor running, and she like runs up to the office. Um, to, to kind of scope out the scene before sending Moon Orchid to go up there and confront her husband. Um, so when Brave Orchid gets, you know, to whatever floor it is in this, in this high rise and, uh, and surveys this, um, uh, this, uh, this, this medical office, she finds that the lobby was chrome and glass with ashtray stands and plastic couches arranged in, arranged, uh, arranged in semicircles, unquote. So this kind of vision of glossy modernity. When she exits the elevator into the medical office's waiting room, we get a hint of the true tension, the true reason why Brave Orchid hatched this plan to reunite her sister with her husband in the first place. What she sees there is, quote, a room full of men and women. Uh, she says, a room full of men and women looked up from their magazine. She could tell by their eagerness for change that this was a waiting room. Behind a sliding glass partition sat a young woman in a modern nurse's uniform. It was an expensive waiting room, Brave Orchid, uh, Brave Orchid approved. The patients looked well-dressed, not sickly and poor, unquote. And so this entire time, she's sort of comparing her, uh, uh, what she sees here in this very modern, very glitzy waiting room with her experience of medical treatments um, as a doctor in, in China. But this, this reaction here, Brave Orchid approved, this is a very strange reaction. So why is this re her reaction? What becomes clear in this chapter and the previous one, which is titled Shaman, is that Brave Orchid deeply resents her deprofessionalization. And one big reason why she guilt trips uh, Maxine so intensely throughout the book is because she displaces this resentment onto Maxine. Before Brave Orchid emigrated to the United States, she was trained as a physician and became a well-respected field medic in China. She had to abandon that career and the social status it afforded her when she moved to California to reunite with her own husband and to work in his laundry. What Brave Orchid approves of when she sees this medical office is how it realizes a fantasy of economic mobility that could have been hers. This is why, in her efforts to convince Moon Orchid to reunite with her husband, Brave Orchid awkwardly blurts out at one moment. This also feels out of place when it happens, but it makes sense when you understand how uh, important deprofessionalization and resentment around it is to the, the entire narrative of Women Warrior. Brave Orchid blurts out at one moment, he's a doctor like me. So condensed into Brave Orchid's approval is an identification uh, with Moon Orchid's husband's profession as a doctor, and perhaps also a vertiginous realization that had she immigrated after 1965, that that medical office, that glitzy modern medical office, or one like it, could very well have been her own. All right, last section. Racial form in the era of deindustrialization. So among the clearest and most convincing theories of Asian racial form that we have is offered by Ico Day in her 2016 book, Alien Capital. Uh, building upon Colleen's foundational, Colleen Lai's uh, foundational work on 19th and early 20th century US discourses of Asian exclusion and trans-Pacific political economy, and Moisha Postone's work on the racialization of capitalist domination, Day argues that Asiatic racial form in North America is primordially, primordially anchored to a false antinomy of abstract versus concrete labor. Adapting Postone, she traces this to a settler colonial ideology of romantic anti-capitalism, which creates three positions, indigenous, alien, and settler. To these positions, a variety of social meanings are assigned. Asians, as free imported labor, occupy the role of aliens who can be excluded and expelled. They are contradicting distinguished from Native Americans who can be eliminated but not expelled. Blacks who can be excluded but also not expelled, and the white settlers who naturalize and control the whole scheme. Following the narrative of romantic anti-capitalism, the Asian signals uh, the overthrow of traditional, pure, concrete conceptions of labor for an era that reduces human individuality to an abstract form of repetition and equivalence." Unquote. 
So key to Day's account of the Asiatic racial form is how the materiality of the Asian body sustains romantic anti-capitalism's false antinomy, concealing, in the manner of what Marx calls fetishism, the commensurability of all forms of labor under capitalism, concrete or not, as well as capitalism's core operation of extracting profit by abstracting labor as a quantity of time. Asian bodies make some forms of labor appear qualitatively different than the kinds of labor that white bodies do, even though they're all just labor. As Day makes clear, her account of Asian racial form is tightly associated with industrialization, with the historical process of industrialization, a period in which Asian waged labor, primarily Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino, was recruited as reserve armies to serve America's rapidly expanding industrial needs. These populations were disciplined through segregation policies and exclusion laws that continued in various forms until the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which, as I outlined earlier, made immigration a matter of fiscal policy and shifted its orientation from exclusion and restriction to inclusion and selection. This connection between racial abjection and jurid juridical exclusion has formed the basis of Asian Americanist historiography and political expression. And for Day, this connection is emblematized by the figure of the coolie. In Yoon Sun Lee's helpful gloss, the Asian body serves a primarily visual function in Day's argument. Indeed, Day opens her book with a brilliant analysis of a visual object. She recounts an incident in 2012 when the Bank of Canada replaced an image of a female Asian scientist that you see pictured there on its newly designed $100 bill with an allegedly neutral Caucasian-looking woman. That's the that one that's actually pictured there. In Day's reading, an image of a female Asian scientist on a banknote was too upsetting as an emblem of Canadian national identity for the focus groups that the bank cons consulted because it crystallized a racial form in which Asians personify capital itself. The decision to neutralize the image thus demonstrates how, uh, this is Day's argument, the contemporary econo economism of Asian racial form does not represent a break from the past, unquote, but rather a continuity with its 19th century forms. So drawing a line between exclusion era in Canada and the United States, uh, exclusion era Asian racial form in the 19th century to uh, uh, Asian racial form in the 21st century. So although the visual basis of Asian racial forms 19th century logics are undeniably still with us, as Yun Sun Lee goes on to point out, visuality cannot account for everything. The racialization of Asians as the embodiment of all of capitalism's evils depends in no small way upon a prevalence of opportunities to set one's eyes on Asian bodies performing labor to register, in Marx's words, their sensuous qualities as, uh, as labor commodities. We recall in Marx's account of fetishism, however, that commodities possess another dimension besides this. Commodities, he writes, are sensuous things which are at the same time supersensible or social. It's along these lines that Yoon Sun Lee argues that Asians can be most visibly and consequentially represented when they are not explicitly represented or visualized at all. And here, of course, Lee's, Lee's framing is inspired by Colleen Lai's account of how representations of Asiatic racial form are guided by kind of anthropomorphic bias. So what Day helps us to see, I would argue, is how in Asian American studies, the visual is the preeminent vehicle of the metaphorical duplicity at the heart of capitalist value. And also, that the visual is not only an analytical crux, but a whole historia, historical, historiographical apparatus anchored to North American industrialization. Day's distinction between an Asian racial form that welds the visuality of the Asian body to processes, processes of abstraction and a racial form that welds Asian visual representation to capital itself helps us to grasp Takeo Rivera's observation that, quote, Asiatic racial form shifts according to the status of material labor conditions, unquote. It also helps us to approach Asian racial form from a different direction, as a matter of periodization. What happens to Asian racial form when US industrial expansion gives way to an extended period of deindustrialization? In industrialization, Asians, especially Chinese and Japanese, were occupationally concentrated in labor-intensive productive occupations, for instance, farming, railroad building, mining, factories, and laundries, like the one that Maxine Hong Kingston's father ran. 
that brought them in physical proximity to processes of labor abstraction. Since the end of World War II, industrial activity, <coughs> manufacturing, and the corporate rate of profit have declined steadily in the United States, a trend called deindustrialization. As Jasper Burns writes, deindustrialization marks a period in which, quote, people, by and large, turn from work based on making things or objects, those labor-intensive productive occupations of the pre-65 period, to work oriented around the performance of administrative and technical processes or the provision of services to customers. This turn away from the kind of work in which bodily labor is highly visible has been even more pronounced among post-65 Asian Americans who, as we have seen, are occupationally concentrated into STEM fields and so-called knowledge work in much higher proportions compared to other racial groups. So two quick examples of how industrial deindustrialization has been thematized in recent Asian American fiction. So Ling Ma's novel Severance, um, it's a post-apocalyptic uh, zombie novel. The protagonist's college honors art project is a collection of, quote, color photos of decaying steel mills, Saturday nights at polka, ho po polka halls, bocce games, in the back of Italian restaurants, a Rust Belt series that was supposed to be the first of several on declining industries in America. The post-apocalyptic urban and landscapes in the novel are supposed to resonate with these Rust Belt images. Another recent novel, uh, Marie Young Oak Lee's uh, really excellent novel, The Evening Hero, uh, from two years ago, which is set in northern Minnesota, was inspired by histories of manufacturing and mining industries being replaced by healthcare industries. So um, the kind of history that Gabriel Winant tells in his book, The Next Shift. Lee's protagonist, a Korean American doctor, is forced into retirement when his, when his hospital is restructured by a private equity firm. He then goes to work for his son's retail medicine startup. Trained to produce miraculous economic growth, post-65 Northeast Asian Americans, like Lee's protagonists, have languished in deindustrializing de America in a very particular way. So to recall Day's reading of that female scientist on the Canadian bill and the visuality of Asian racial form against the backdrop of deindustrialization, it's relevant that the female Asian scientist is a scientist. The history behind the scientist's representation isn't one that we can trace into a visual register, and it's more a legacy of mid-20th century modernization projects than 19th century industrialization. If there has been a revival of the dialectical analysis of race and class in Asian American studies, of which Day's book is a powerful example, and the work of, uh, of Alda and Marte Wood over here, and Rogany is, is part of this as well, I suspect that what has prompted it is due as much to developments outside of Asian American studies as with contradictions that have unfolded within the field. And so here I have in, in mind how the fetishistic power of romantic anti-capitalism has diminished. The question posed by capitalism today is overwhelmingly whether or not we can survive it as a species, not to mention as immiserated workers whose wages have been stagnant for the past half century. It's not whether we can rescue our concrete labor from the alienation of capitalist abstraction. Our collective sense that there is no alternative to free market capitalism, which Mark Fisher famously dubbed capitalist realism, reigns supreme. Just like industrial processes are still with us, though residually, the contours of romantic anti-capitalism are still with us as well. But its narrative has morphed into an ideology that places the hyper-awareness of capitalist realism's foreclosure on one side and the openness of liberation on the other. So as Annie McClanahan has put it, uh, this antinomy, this is what this antinomy often looks like, machinic autonomy or human labor, automated factories or a labor-driven service sector, automation and growth or technological and economic stagnation. So the moral panic over ChatGPT, for instance, would be a version of this. So how does Asian racial form in the era of deindustrialization fix to the super central, sensual dimension of the commodity, and what does this tell us? And I'm just wrapping up here. Throughout this talk, we've encountered a number of characters who have helped us to understand this. Hua Xu and his father, Cheng Rei Li's John Huang, Ken Liu's Chinese-American historian and Japanese-American physicist uh, spouse, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston's literary avatar, Charles Yu's fictional namesake and his father, Li Ma's uh, protagonist with her uh, Rust Belt art project, and even Amy Chua. So all of these characters point us to a key feature of Asian racial form in the era of deindustrialization. What makes them Asian American, with the emphasis on Asian, is how their authors use them as characters to remediate legacies of modernization through narratives of economic subject formation, the aestheticization of the two cultures' conflict, and more often than not, by literally circulating them between Asia and the US. 
Their racial form is associated not with their bodily capacity to produce commodities, which remind us, reminds us of capitalism's abstraction of labor, but with their capacity to reproduce capital itself, which reminds us of exchange, circulation, and mobility. In the era of deindustrialization, it is the STEM professional rather than the coolie that's the preeminent figure for Asian racial form. Whereas the locus of Asian racialization during industrialization was the sensuous dimension of production and labor, these characters and the forms to which they come into existence demonstrate to us that this locus has expanded to encompass the supersensory dimensions of capital itself. This does not, of course, mean that surplus value is no longer generated through the abstraction of labor. It means that deindustrialization has different needs for Asian labor than industrialization did, and that the social forms that we call race have shifted accordingly to facilitate this. These characters help us to track the supracentral dimension of the social and its entanglement with the sensuous, a whole depth of history and material relations in which the economic, cultural, and ideological routes that transimperial modernization established are traced and retraced. They also bring into relief one of the main points that this book wants to make, which is that Asian American identity, especially Northeast Asian American identity, is, a, is today as much a class identity as it is a racial identity. Thank you. Um, I want to just say out loud to the folks in the Zoom room, who hopefully can hear me, that if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A, um, and we will be happy to read them out loud for Chris, and I can, I can do that. Um, I'm going to turn around so I can help Chris find questions for the folks here. I'm going to maybe I'll move to the side here. Ah, okay. okay. What questions do you have? Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I know at least some folks in this room, uh, some of them might have left, have read your essay on Maxine Hunkings. Oh, okay. So I, I, won't, I won't call on them to speak to it, but okay, go for it. Please. This is more of like a personal question, yes. um, but you talked about the two cultures conflict trope, and I was wondering if that's something like you experienced growing up, like if you were going one direction. You can ask my parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, you can ask my son, Elliot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, the, uh, uh, when I when I when I started uh, college, I, I int intended to be a uh, computer science major, but um, uh, you know, very quickly abandoned that plan because uh, you know what attracted me to initially a political science major we called it government at Cornell, um, and eventually a, an English major was actually like the dimension of politics and uh, and writing, and so there was a, there was investment in. Uh, the sort of political affordances of the aesthetic that really drew me to those majors um, and uh, sort of propelled me away from computer science. Um, but this was also, you know, so that's sort of how it personally played out in, in, in my life. But this is something, th this is one of those tensions that, that I find in so many of my, like, Northeast Asian American friends. This, this, there's the stereotype that, you know, Asian parents don't let their kids go into the arts, right? Um, and so part of what I kind of, uh, you know, uh, what writing this book helped me to flesh out are the historical reasons behind that prohibition, right? I think uh, often, you know, um, uh, the children of, of Asian American immigrants will sort of react negatively to this, you know, say, being unreasonable, why can't I go to the arts, why don't you believe in me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, uh, that distinction between the arts and sciences, um, the encouragement to go into the arts, it has a history, right? Uh, and it's a history that's larger than any sort of parent-child configuration. It's a history that uh, brought the parents to the United States in the first place, um, and that uh, that brought you know the child into the uh, into the situation in which they're choosing a major in at all, you know, uh, going into college, right? So this kind of trajectory is uh, uh, this kind of professional educational and professional trajectory is um, uh, uh, has, itself has a history. Right, and it's deeply connected to these modernization processes that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Were you going for something more personal? No, that was <laughs> okay. it. Uh, what? Yeah. No, you, 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 can, you can moderate your own questions. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. 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 Okay, fine. Um, I'm, I have something going, I don't know, about professionalization. Yeah. And in particular, I'm wondering about 
like you're speaking to a moment in which people start becoming creative writing majors, essentially, mm -hmm. right? I'm wondering if you can talk about like the state's promotion of that. In particular, I'm thinking of like the Iowa Writers Workshop, and I'm wondering what like what the interaction there is between the formation of a particular like subset of the professional class mm -hmm. and race and racial form and then also like what the CIA is doing in producing like anti-communist propaganda essentially yeah. like promoting that prom uh, uh, production yeah that, that's a really great question um, so a lot of that is happening during the same post-war period right the CIA uh, sort of uh, I, I, I read something recently about this. So the, the, the actual funding, that the, the actual dollar amount of funding that the CAA put into um, the Iowa Writers Workshop wasn't a huge amount mm -hmm. of money, but the um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the sort of uh, figurehead of Iowa Writers Workshop, whose name is escaping me right now, um, Paul uh, Engel. was that Paul Engel? Paul Engel, yeah, right, uh, was uh, very devoted to this uh, to this cause, and so a lot of that energy um, uh, came from Paul Engel. Himself. Um, and, uh, you know, among the, the kind of uh, writers that they tried to cultivate in Iowa were these Northeast Asian American writers, but also, you know, Southeast Asian uh, American uh, writers, um, Filipino uh, writers as well. So there's a whole history, there's a lot of work that's done on um, uh, some of these figures. Uh, Neil Hualing was uh, um, a major figure in Iowa as well, um, a Taiwanese uh, American. Uh, writer. Um, and so uh, a lot of this is happening, a lot of this is unfolding in the, the pre-65 period. And uh, in, in terms of the production of Asian American literature itself, Iowa, as far as, as, far as I'm aware, did not have as much, um, especially during the, the, the Paul Engel uh, period, did not have as much of a, a hand in shaping um, post-65 Asian American literature, in part because um, Asian Americans didn't really start publishing fiction, writing and publishing fiction in large quantities, in large numbers, until the 1990s. And so this is Min Hyung Song's uh, uh, thesis in his book, uh, The Children of 1965, which is a major um, source of inspiration uh, for, for my book. Um, and his thesis is a, it's a very simple one. It's that, uh, it's, uh, so his question is, why uh, do we not see Asian American fiction emerge until the 1990s? Well, it's because it's not until then that the children of that initial wave of post-65 immigrants started to become started to come of age. They started to enter their 20s and produce fiction. So there just weren't enough Asian um, Americans in uh, 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 in enough numbers um, during the Paul Engel period to uh, to really feel the, the sort of anti-communist um, uh, uh, kind of ideological emphasis that came out of. Iowa. But there are a lot of other like fairly prominent examples of Asian American writers during the period um, uh, that did. So that's a great question. Thank you. Do you mind if I follow up? No, I'm just it. wondering, um, I guess I'm thinking a bit like longer in terms also of like the China rights narrative. Mm -hmm. To me, those are very closely connected, like anti-communist growth in media very generally and then the way that we see it now I feel plays out a lot in like the the paranoia of a falling American hegemony or yeah. whatever. Like to me those are very maybe not the same thing, but they're close. It's, this is a this is a great question. So I was just I just finished writing a review of uh, Netflix adaptation of three body problem <laughs> uh, which is uh, Liu Cixing, the, the the most famous science fiction writer in the world right now, Chinese science fiction writer um, uh, this, block, but this blockbuster trilogy of, uh, of novels. Um, uh, my, 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 my partner Amy and I have been talking nonstop about this adaptation uh, for, the past, uh, for the past month. Um, but there is a, uh, it, it's interesting that, you know, it, it's a Chinese, uh, th this is the first part of the answer, I'm going to get to the second part of the answer, which has to do with Chinese American writers, and part of the reason why I think there have been so many debuts from Chinese American writers in the past 10 years. It has exactly to do, I think, with what you're talking about. Um, but Three Body Problem is interesting because when, uh, the, when uh, the novels were first serialized in, 20, in, in 2006, there was an implicit US-China allegory where the invading aliens were the United States. They had this incomprehensibly advanced technology that was a threat but also would go to innovation and um, to the you know, victimized humans. Um, 
But when Netflix takes up the three-body problem, it has to reverse the allegory, right? Because Netflix is an American company, and so now China becomes the incomprehensibly advanced uh, set of, uh, you know, um, uh, the alien race, and the victims are implicitly this kind of multi, even though it's said in England, there's some complications, but uh, this implicitly this kind of multicultural uh, sort of uh, liberal um, formation that's supposed to allegorize uh, the United States. So there's a kind of anti-communism that that, uh, that emerges there, and you can read the, the there are these very important scenes of the Cultural Revolution and the Red Guards um, uh, prosecuting and uh, killing the the father of the, the sort of one of the main characters in the first novel. And you know, in the Chinese context, that's not necessarily that, that's not seen as anti-China. That's seen as critical of the Mao period, right? Which is something that's quite loud in China. But in the U.S. context, it's seen as potentially quite anti-China, anti-communist, right? Um, uh, so, anyways, that's that's just one example that uh, that, I, that I have on, on my mind, and I think is uh, that's something that's been uh, uh, sort of parsed in interesting ways over the last few weeks as reviews of three body problems have, have come in. Um, but the second part of the answer I'll say really quickly is that yeah, there have been all these de debuts by Chinese American writers um, over the past ten years, and so many of them have these return narratives, of, as, as I mentioned earlier. And a lot of these return narratives, they're not anti-communist in any way, shape, or form. Uh, if anything, what they are is trying to imagine, and, and I talked also about, um, about Asian American writers bumping up against the limits of Asian American identity. And so this is a good example of that. Um, that these Chinese American debut writers, a lot of which are of 1.5 generation, so they came to the United States as children, um, and uh, uh, the, the kind of stories that they write are about these transnational lives of you know, flexible citizens that, uh, um, that live lives live between the United States and uh, and China or other locations or other locations in Asia, and the real the idea really seems to be to kind of describe and animate a subject formation that is, for lack of a better word, transnationally Asian or globally Asian, right? So that's not Asian American, that's not Chinese, right? But that is some sort of combination of of the two. Um, and uh, in these narratives, there's not really a kind of anti-communism. If anything, there's a there, there's a sort of admiration for the for the kind of rhymes and the structural similarities between American capitalism and Chinese capitalism, and also a strong sense of uh, uh, there's more 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 tendency to fetishize um, the sort of power of the authoritarian government of an authoritarian government to hypercharge capitalism than there is a sort of critique of it. Um, and I think a lot of openness to those sorts of narratives has uh, has to do with the, the the sort of you know the the, um, the struggles that American capitalism has had you know. Steadily since the '70s, but especially since the, especially since 2008, um, and uh, you know, with uh, the, the, the sort of intensification of U.S.-China conflict. So you ended up, I think, pretty close to where my question was going to head. Okay. Okay. So you're a critic. You've presented many of these works of creative writing. I don't know how many are memoir and how many are fiction. You didn't. That yeah. distinction wasn't super important to you, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know to what extent a critique of political economy is frequently found in those works that you presented, but it's very obvious in your own work, right? And obviously in other scholars' works as well. And so where do you see that coming in? The critique of political economy? Yeah. yeah. Um, I see it really as crucial to understanding contemporary Asian America. Well, I, I, mean, I, I see it sort of foundational for understanding the world, but I think yeah. it's... So from these writers' point of view, do you oh. see it coming in, in their work? Yeah. Or are they not doing that? Is that something that literary critics are bringing to these Oh, okay, books? okay. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I actually see it like quite expansively and increasingly in, in their work. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah. why that? Yes. Why? Um, I think uh, the reason has to do with the 1990s. I think it has to do with um, the, the sort of opening up of uh, of Asian capital and of Asia to capital. Um, you know, 1992 is when Deng Xiaoping does the Southern Tour and sort of recommits China to um, uh, to uh, uh, um, to capitalism, to global capitalism and foreign investment. Um, and I think uh, you know, during this sort of like the, the initial years of the the, the kind of post-socialist period, this this idea that you know history has ended, globalization um, has has triumphed, liberal. Um, capitalism has has triumphed. Um, uh, this is exactly the moment when 
Asian Americans start to write fiction. And so at, they're in this interesting moment where folks like Chang Rui Lee are, you know, I talked about that in that very, very small uh, moment in passing at the very end of the novel. That novel, by the way, there's, there's, so, much, there's so much political economy in that novel. There's finance capital, um, there's industrialization, there's deindustrialization, um, there's big data. Um, and uh, at the very end of the novel, there's just that one little note about return circulation, reverse circulation to um, back to South Korea. Uh, and I think what, 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 what Lee is, is picking up on there is just it is trying to register and trying to square Asian American identity, which is Korean American identity specifically, which is what he's pursuing in that novel, with you know, where the direction of capital is leading now, where the direction of reality in a lot of ways is leading. Um, and it's something that I think Lee, because he was so intensely read as an Asian American writer, as a Korean American writer for so long, is something that perhaps you could not sort of fully embrace or fully engage with until much later, you know. Um, there's a way that he kind of does engage with China and with um, the, the kind of fantasy of uh, Chinese capitalism projected very, very far in the future in his science fiction novel On Such a Full Sea, uh, which was from 10 years ago. Um, but a sort of uh, uh, more or less realist um, depiction of, uh, of China and return to Asia it doesn't come until my year abroad in, in 2021. Yeah. So. Can, I, can I sneak in a question from the Zoom room? Yes. And then and then you have back to, sorry, I know there's a bunch of hands. Um, but Julia Lee has a question. She says, thank you for this wonderful talk. I'm really looking forward to reading the entire book. I appreciated the fact that you described the talk and book as being a partial account, and likewise your use of the identity marker Northeast Asian American. That goes along with the care you take to historicize Asian racial form and literary form in the post-65 era. I'm wondering how far you are willing to lean into the partial element of your argument. Another version of this question might be, do you see the things you describe in your book happening evenly across these specific national ethnic groups across the entire period of late 20th century, early 20th century, or is there a way to parse it out even more finely? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Julia. Um, I'm going to answer that in reverse. So I do not see these formations unfolding evenly. So there's a, there's a really great, great quote, for instance, uh, just uh, from Elaine Castillo. Um, this is a, an early essay of hers before her debut novel, um, but she writes the most a Filipinex, uh, queer Filipinex American novel, uh, novelist, uh, writer, fiction writer. Um, she wrote in this early essay, the most realist mode for an immigrant is science fiction. For this, I know, is also science fiction. The worlding of your body is a hyper is hyper meaningful to the point of allegory. So in a lot of ways, this quote seems like this is this would be like perfect for my book, right? She's just sort of stating my case here, right? Um, that Asian Americans are, uh, of all stripes, are attracted to, to, to science fiction or science fictionality in some way, shape, or form. But Elaine Casilia, this becomes very clear in her debut novel, um, America is Not the Heart, which is a beautiful, excellent novel that everybody needs to read. Um, that novel is very much about uh, foreign medical professionals from the Philippines coming to the United States, right? And a lot of times to escape the Marcos um, dictatorship. So uh, she, the, this, the science fictionality that she's writing about here tracks that history far more than it tracks the history of modernization and human capital development that I'm tracking vis-a-vis -vis Northeast Asia in my book. So choosing Northeast Asia is not, as I said before, a kind of arbitrary choice. What I'm trying to do is understand who an Asian American author is if we take away the determining category of a racial essentialism or a cultural essentialism. So what does Asia mean? And if we, if we really dig down into that, then what we find there are different histories that aren't necessarily reconcilable, right, in an, in an immediate or obvious way. So this is one of those histories, how this, this kind of um, uh, post-war sort of Marcos era production of foreign medical uh, professionals, especially nurses, that get, uh, that get trained and, uh, and um, uh, often repatriate to the United States. This is a different history that traces, that offers us an opportunity for historicizing Philippinex literature, Philippinex American literature in a different way than Northeast Asian American literature. And I also mentioned at the very front of the, the talk, Timothy August's really excellent book, um, The Refugee Aesthetic, which um, rather than using, uh, Rather than using um, Northeast Asian uh, trans-imperialism and the rapid industrialization development of human capital as a kind of material basis for his account of Southeast Asian literary aesthetics, uses the experience of the refugee of non-voluntary um, uh, uh, immigration 
as the basis for his account. So this would be, I think, a really, really great companion and sort of how I see the, the kind of methodology that I'm sketching out of focusing on regional particularities and following the historical materialist trajectory into the literary forms. Another way that it plays out, but in the Southeast Asian context. So, all in. Chris, thanks for that incredible talk. Um, I, I have a question that um, I, I think is it's, it's coming from um, what you're calling the remediation of legacies of modernization, and this and this kind of periodization that you're using um, the kind of character tropes of the coolie on the one hand as a kind of stand-in for pre-1965 uh, moments um, that are explicitly linked to industrial production, for production, maybe not industrial, but production. Sure. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, you know, the, the STEM professionals, the post-65 um, sort of link um, to a, a form of deindustrialization that's privileging um, uh, you know, a, a turn to circulation within all the capitalist networks. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking um, about, um, about severance. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how severance, um, you know, so so much of, of what severance is also grappling with, um, with with it, its its returns to Shenzhen, et cetera, et cetera, right? Is thinking about the capitalist logistics yeah. more broadly and generally. And one of the, the strange things that I've always, you know, had a hard time grappling with in terms of in terms of thinking about logistics and circulation yeah. is that is it like is it production or is it circulation? Is it, it's a kind of mess between right. the two. And, and so, you know, I'm also then thinking now then about, um, and I'm, so I'm linking that um, kind of insight to an earlier comment that, that you just made in, in response to one of these questions about um, uh, the 1990s moment, um, the kind of boom, right, of Asian, Asian American literature, right, the production of Asian American literature. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could say something about maybe a kind of what happens, like, have you thought at all about, like, the, the kind of the problems perhaps hopefully productive problems that emerge when like we're thinking about like the messiness between uh, thinking about the kind of spheres of production and spheres of circulation yeah. in regards to Asian American literary production. So like I'm thinking here of, you know, um, uh, everything really before, the, the ways in which people talk about Asian American literature before like the, the IE anthology, right? It's about finding those moments. Like this is the first, Bulasan's the first Filipino American right. novel, right? right. Um, Nona Boy is, is the first novel about you know yeah. Japanese internment experience. You know, yeah. it's, it's these 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 moments of like this is the singular um, uh, uh, act of, of production within these national frameworks. Yeah, is it? And then in my mind, you know, to, to account for the '90s moment, like where are the novels before the '90s? And the question is here: is it that they're not being produced, or is this a problem of circulation that they're they're not yeah. circulating more generally and widely? Yeah. And so I have a question. So the question then is. Can you, can you connect that then to the kind of post-65 sort of moment where circulation becomes of tantamount importance at the level of like reception, like audience reception, to think about not just the, the content of the novels themselves, but the kind of networks of circulation that are now emerging to support yeah. our engagement with them. Yeah, your, yeah. Work, your work with Hyphen, right, right, right. The, the kind of support of the Asian American Writers Workshop, yeah. mm -hmm. presses like Kaya Press, right? So at the level of reception, thinking about circulation as like, it's sort of circulation, but it's also yeah. enabling production in a right. weird way. Right, 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 right. Can you think at all, I would just like, really love to hear you think through that yeah. out loud. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Alden. Um, that, that's a great set of questions. I, I'm going to have to admit it from the outset that I feel like I don't have the empirical um, uh, knowledge to be able to answer that question as fully as I want to, and it's something that um, that I, I, I really wish I had. There are all these great works of you know um, of literary sociology that have come out uh, in recent years, like you know uh, Dan Simmons' Big Fiction, like Laura McGrath's work on on agents, um, but just really sort of shining light on how circulation happens, how production happens in the American literary marketplace in particular, that I think has a, has a real bearing on the question that you're asking. Like, um, one version of the question that you're asking, if I'm understanding it correctly, or one part of the question that you're asking is, um, is why is it that we're seeing so much Asian American fiction right now? Before the 1990s, people uh, used to say that you could read all of Asian American fiction. You could just read all of it, so why not, right? And in the mid-80s, you know, um, there's, that, there's that great uh, annotated bibliography of Asian American literature. It was possible to write something like that. It is not possible anymore. It became impossible very, very quickly in the early 90s. So one question is like, why are we seeing more of this? And I think it's more, uh, and I, I don't think a, a, a response like, oh, because there's more consumer interest in this. I don't think that's an adequate response, right? 
Um, how do you describe consumer interest? How is that tracked? Um, how is that confirmed? All of those things. I don't think that's adequate. I think we really have to understand like who the people are in some respects and also how um, the publishing industry uh, works and in order to incentivize the further production of, um, there have been so many debut novels by Asian American writers, especially Asian American women writers over the past 10 years. I'm just talking about like Northeast Asian American writers. So when I kind of like called it a wrap on this text in 2022, I mean, I, I was doing my best to keep up. It was, it was a little bit like frenetic and insane about keeping up with this stuff. Um, and there was a point where I was just like, I can't, I can't, I just like cannot do this anymore. And since then, there have been so many novels published, just novels I'm talking about, not even like short story collections, not memoirs, not things that are sort of, I'm talking in the, in the vein of literary fiction that have come out that would be perfect to incorporate into this book. And I mentioned some of them today um, that I just, you know, anyway, so there's more and more. So that's what, that's one, that's one non-answer to your question. I wish I could answer more of it. That, that's how I would answer it if I, if I had more sort of empirical knowledge. Um, in terms of the, the sort of shift uh, to logistics and as, you know, circulation kind of being the product rather than the commodity itself, and how that affects um, um, the production of Asian American literature. The one thing that I can say confidently is that um, that process in itself uh, changes what we call Asian racial form, right? So when you have Asians at the point of production in the factory or on, like in the mines or on the railroads or something like that, then Asian racial form has specific affordances and has specific um, modes of representation, right? During, let's call it industrialization. But, you know, during periods in which, in which the bodies are moved around, in which the economy of visuality and sensuality is, uh, is shifted, then what we call Asian racial form is going to shift. So, in, you know, one way to talk about it is, uh, as I was saying, in terms of periodization, industrialization to deindustrialization. We can argue about whether or not that's actually periodization. Um, but also, like, you can slice it even further and just talk about these processes. Like, how, how does logistics sort of dominate the way that, um, that, let's just focus on human capital circulating between Asia and the United, just the United States. How does that sort of change the way that, uh, that uh, processes, that forms of race um, uh, shift and transform? How does that change the way that we represent them? Um, and I mean, those are the kinds of questions that I'm hoping people will sort of be inspired to ask and pursue um, based on a, a study like mine. But sorry for these non-answers, but those are, those are great questions. I mean, it's great. It's building upon, I think, what I'm, what I'm talking about. There were a couple of hands. I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, yeah. um, for like immigrants whose experiences don't really fit the experience of being like recruited and like being highly selected, yeah. when they come to America, do you see them as like, tending to adopt the like STEM professional racial form or like trying to like distinguish themselves from that or maybe like a variety of different outcomes? Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I'm not going to say what I, I haven't, I haven't studied this in an empirical way. I borrow from the work of people who have studied in an empirical way. So um, Jennifer Lee and Minzo, so, for instance, there, there are a lot of other people who have sort of uh, studied this phenomenon. They call it second generation convergence. And that's, that's one particular formation of what you're talking about, right? Um, and so what they're studying specifically are uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, communities in Southern California. And uh, they're, they're looking at the children of refugees who came after 1975 um, and how, you know, they came, as I was saying before, with uh, so, so uh, like drastically fewer resources than Northeast Asians came to the United States. And yet, the children of these immigrants begin to exhibit many of the similar educational and professional outcomes that more privileged um, Northeast Asians um, have exhibited. And so their question is, uh, why is this happening, right? So, I mean, we should, uh, like, it, it sounds safe to assume that if you come to the United States with limited resources, limited educational and financial resources, then uh, your chances, your children's, your chances of having higher educational and economic outcomes of that kind of mobility are going to be lower. Your children's are going to be lower. Um, and yet, the opposite seems to be the case, at least in Southern California, in these uh, Vietnamese um, uh, uh, communities there. And so their question is, why is this happening? Uh, and so their answer is that there's this thing that they call the success rank. And so culture is sort of the answer. And kind of, this is one of the, uh, one of the effects of American racism and racial description on Asian American communities. It groups 
Asians together, you know, whether you are a, like a Southeast Asian refugee or if you are hyper-privileged um, elites from China, you, you're grouped together and you are seen as the same sort of model minority. Um, and that has an effect, that actually has a material effect, the success frame. And it's a success frame that we all are, you know, just sort of stereotypically aware of, that, you know, you get all A's, you go to college, you come to a place like Rice, you know, you major in a STEM field, you go on and get a lucrative career. That frame has a racial character that binds these communities together, produces these kind of unexpected effects like second generation convergence. So that's just, that's just one account that, that they have. I, I hope that answers your question. I, I was thinking we should let folks go uh, also on the webinar since it's after six, but I'll just say one of the questioners yeah, had yeah, asked, um, among other things, how do you sift through so many novels, which is you already answered a little bit earlier um, and noted that it's amazing yeah. uh, that you were able to do that. Um, Agni, but you had had your hand up earlier. Do you want to sneak one in? And of course, understanding that some folks might have to leave, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that is much of what I wanted to ask was already answered and I'm glad. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, in your uh, vast um, uh, survey of these, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, uh, since you talked about the return narrative, I mean, did you did you um, encounter something like the, um, <coughs> for the lack of a better uh, phrase, I am, I mean, I'm just like contingently calling it the uh, um, uh, uh, diffusal narrative where, I mean, set in the present day where the character like sees the possibility of yeah. like moving to the the US or the West more generally, yeah. and then say no. Ah. Um, and and I ask that because I have encountered that very recently in a, a couple of South Asian movies. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was wondering if you saw that in your that movie. is. That's a really great question. Um, I, I, uh, I'll just give you a, a couple of, of examples of this. Um, a, a novel uh, that I teach uh, a lot is Transmission by Harry Kinsry that sort of features, like it's a kind of H1B visa um, uh, narrative in which you know, um, an Indian computer scientist moves to the United States, has a terrible time, and then just sort of circulates into the, back into the ether. Um, that's one thing. And there have been increasingly, uh, you know, return narratives. This is something I feel like Raghini can speak to um, uh, uh, quite well uh, also. Uh, but just a couple of examples that come to mind. Um, I was re recently reading a friend's uh, paper about a spate of Taiwanese films that feature um, these Taiwanese immigrants that I'm talking about, except now, except they return to Taiwan, right? But they bring their entire families back from the United States to Taiwan because their dreams in, in Taiwan were not realized. And um, in a lot of ways, this is, this is Emily Saxinian's account of how Silicon Valley became what it is now, it became the sort of you know, behemoth of, of innovation um, that it is now. It's because, and this is, this is a story that's, that, that's told, uh, I think, very, very uh, poignantly in, in Charles Hughes' How to Live Safely in Science Fiction in the Universe, um, these STEM professionals that come from East Asia and want to realize their ambitions in the United States, they hit the ceiling, right? And then they return to um, their countries of origin, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and they establish the kind of supply chains for semiconductors, let's say, so, uh, 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 so Morris Chang, the, the president of Taiwan Semiconductor um, Manufacturing Company, uh, he is an example of this. Um, he was very successful at Texas Instruments, but circulated back to Taiwan because Taiwan called him back and called back many, many people. In fact, Taiwan in, in the 1970s, uh, in the 1980s, they would send people uh, to the United States to talk to engineers to say, you, you know, things aren't panning out the way that you, that, that you thought. Why don't you come back to Taiwan and, and, and participate in our, our rapid industrialization that won over a lot of people um, uh, uh, that way, including people like Washi's father. Um, so I think, uh, and, and this is the, the story that Annalise Saxonian tells, uh, that Silicon Valley could not be what it is. We would not have websites like, we would not have a Google, we would not have Facebook, we would not have any of these things if it were not for the hardware that the new Argonauts, that these East Asian entre immigrant entrepreneurs that circulated back to their home countries and established the supply chains that made possible these you know, wonders of the internet or whatever, it wouldn't be possible without these immigrant entrepreneurs. It wouldn't be possible without narratives of disappointments, without narratives of um, not enough. 
That's a really inspiring note to. But I will say I want to say one last thing about that that, that that quick question that you had about how I sift through all of this stuff. Yeah. And I'll just say that I I, I I just want to give a shout out to Stephen Hong Soon who has been like my inspiration and been a, a mentor in in um, uh, in my scholarship. And Stephen is very famous for leading everything. Just. Everything is. So, many years maintained this site called Asian American Literature Fans, where he uh, does micro reviews of everything that comes out. His appetite for reading and uh, his uh, his scholarship has just been really inspirational to me. And so the answer is, I just try to keep up with Stephen. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the 35 plus people who joined us on Zoom and everybody who is still here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.